We're here at the CROI, the 2017 CROI in Seattle, Washington, and we're here with Annette Sohn, who has been, um, I don't know, a great supporter of, of uh, issues over the years in HIV. And you are now working with AMFAR. You're the director of Treat Asia and also working on global programs for uh, vice president of global programs for, for AMFAR, which is really important because they've got some money to spend. So, <laughs> so we make sure that you make sure that you get the money spent right and it goes in the right places. Well, I will say that the Treat Asia program raises about 80% of all of our direct program expenses to conduct research, training, and advocacy and policy activities in the Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. And so what what is the, the work that you're doing? I know that you've been doing this, uh, AMFAR has been doing this for a number of years in Asia. It's a direction they went, and it was you know an, a need to be filled. And can you uh, expound on that? Sure. So AMFAR started the Treat Asia program in 2001 in order to address the needs of both research as well as training among clinicians within the Asia Pacific region. So at that time, there was not a lot of emphasis on HIV research in the Asia Pacific. And of course, that's changed, but we really tried to walk alongside our clinician partners along the way. Mm -hmm. So we're in it's Bank, uh, Bangkok, Thailand, and uh, what other locations is it mostly in, in that area? or? So AMFAR has an office in Bangkok, Thailand, but we work with a network of over 60 institutions in 14 countries, as far south as New Zealand, as far north as Japan, west as India, and east, I think, farthest is probably the Philippines. Wow. wow. So how do, you, how do you implement this, what I would consider a massive project? Uh, do you have partners that, that do the work with you, because there's people that provide drugs and and, and so forth, so it's, it's, it's probably a lot of collaborations. All of our clinical research partners are their own clinics and hospitals, so AMPAR doesn't have a specific clinic per se. We don't deliver treatment and care, but we partner with the leading referral centers in the mm -hmm. countries in which we work. And so mm -hmm. they have nationally supported government public hospitals. Some of them are private clinics or research centers as well. Mm -hmm. So you have a few models that you implement dependent upon where they are and who they are and how they operate already. You're working within the frameworks that are already in place. That's right. And that's our goal is to work with our outside partners. And we also have collaborations with civil society organizations. So our goal is really to complement and to provide support for what's happening within the communities in mm -hmm. which we work. Do you try to work on behavioral issues and, and social issues? You were talking earlier that you wanted to talk about the mental health issues. That's right. So uh, we recognize that mental health for people living with HIV is a huge gap for children and adolescents as well as adults in the region. And unfortunately, this is the case across low and middle income, low and middle income settings around the world. In fact, there's less than one psychiatrist or trained psychiatrist for every 100,000 people in low and middle mm -hmm. income countries, most of them and certainly in the Asia Pacific. And that compares to about 13 or 14 psychiatrists for every 100,000 people in the United States. So we have very few trained professionals, but we have just as many people who need those mental health services. Are the people in that population, in that, that cultural population, are they any less needful of these services? I mean, the human condition is such, but uh, I'm just trying to see if, if, we, if they are maybe leading a life that's more mainstream, it doesn't really get complicated like it does in our country? I think our <clears throat> initial focus for our mental health work agenda has been on adolescents. Mm -hmm. In the United States, surveys have shown that about 60% of adolescents living with HIV have some sort of a mental health problem. And so we have very little data in places in Africa and Asia to compare to that. Mm -hmm. So our goal is to say we recognize that people have challenges in the mental health arena and unfortunately in our current healthcare setting, settings in resource limited countries we're really just focused on here's your prescription here's your medicine please mm -hmm. take your pill every day and come and get your blood test mm -hmm. but we're not as good at looking at the overall context mm -hmm. in which that individual lives mm -hmm. do you find um, I mean you're, you're working in this field do you do you find that there's a lot of doctors who are going to contribute their lives to this field because it's it seems as though this is a very important I mean I've talked to a lot of people in mental health 
positions in this country. And it's very, it seems like they believe, as you believe in, in Asia, it's very well under manned, under manned, under manned and, and, and uh, trained and so forth. I mean, I don't know what the dynamics are and the numbers, you gave me some numbers, but it seems like a worthy cause there. And you, so you spend the time finding the right positions that are going to work in a given area or do they move around? I'm just trying to figure out how you, how you make these changes for the, the people who are needful. In the setting where you have so few trained professionals, our goal is not to go to the medical school and, and try to get more people to become psychiatrists. The reality that we're working with is that we need to be able to train general HIV providers, whether they're pediatricians or internal medicine or even primary care providers, mm -hmm. how to look for signs and symptoms of mental health disorder and then to teach them some hopefully straightforward and, and basic interventions, either short-term therapy or medicines that can be used together in combination with therapy in order to help improve the patient's lives. And I think we're at a very early stage right now. We're just talking with experts from around the world to try to find out how do we identify people at great risk. And really what motivated us to go into the area of mental health among adolescents is that we've anecdotally been hearing reports of suicides among young people mm -hmm. who've grown up living with HIV, particularly in Thailand where the Treat Asia program is based. And so we hear about one person who had committed suicide and then another patient who had been on lifelong antiretroviral therapy but then died of tuberculosis, for example, mm -hmm. because she had stopped taking her medicines. And unfortunately, that's increasingly being reported as we start looking for the young people to find out how they're doing as they're growing up to become adults. We're identifying a few of them who are at very high risk for having issues with depression or problems taking their medicines. And that's really what motivated us. I think the clinicians, the pediatricians, we frankly, we didn't know what to do. And we recognized that we needed some guidance from our mental health colleagues. Do you, are you doing or conducting at any time studies and surveys to, to identify the, I mean, how do you do that? Is there, uh, are you implementing studies and, and surveys or whatever it is, focus groups to assess some of those questions? So we just conducted a think tank in January in Bangkok where we brought together our own clinical researchers from Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, and we brought experts from South Africa and the United States to come talk about what can we do to begin developing a mental health research agenda in the Asia Pacific region. And so that gave us some great ideas that we're beginning to work on now. And our first pilots project will be looking at caregiver mental health because among children who grow up with the disease, a key factor in their lives is the mental health and well-being of their caregivers, whether they mm -hmm. themselves have HIV or whether they had been orphaned and now they're being cared for by a relative or a family friend. So mm -hmm. we're first looking at caregiver mental health outcomes in Bangkok, and then we're beginning to explore how we can begin screening for mental health conditions in mm -hmm. adolescents. Mm -hmm. But we also feel there's an ethical need to have treatment to refer them to. So if we identify somebody who has mm -hmm. depression or has an, an anxiety disorder, we're not just doing this to find out mm -hmm. how many people there are with this condition. We want to be able to refer them so that they can get treatment for their condition. Mm -hmm. Would you, once you come to a conclusion of, of what to do and models and so forth, would you like to do a demonstration project or would you refer that to or try to encourage governments or organizations such as Clinton Foundation or others to uh, persist in getting this stuff done? In some of the places where we work, we have a get very good relationship with the government and the National HIV Program, and that's particularly the case in Thailand. So our hope is that if we can begin shining a light on the issues of mental health conditions among young people living with HIV, that we'll be able to use that and bring in policymakers from other programs within the Thai government who can see that and hopefully begin building upon our experience. I, I'm concerned because I think in some cases if the government is convinced that uh, a healthy community is, is also a more affordable community because I, I see that you know it happened in our country we had so many times we said hey it's cheaper to treat these people with the drugs than to leave them not go treated and it's that way certainly with TB and anything else that's communicable so uh, the same thing happens with mental health issues 
if, you, if they go treated, uh, they're going to be less costly for the government. Certainly, when we just talk about mental health conditions, most people don't really realize that if you don't have stable mental health, how can you expect people to want to take their medicines on time or show mm -hmm. up in clinic on time? And so if we as a society, we're committed to the UN AIDS 909090 goals, mm -hmm. we're going to really need to address mental health because we can't expect that we'll mm -hmm. achieve that simply through telling people that they should take their medicines. Mm -hmm. Do you also work with any uh, uh, street drug problems or anything like that? Or is, this, is, this, is that tied in in some way or shape or form? One of the major activities of the Treat Asia program has been to advocate for hepatitis C treatment access using direct acting agents or the oral pills that people can now take for 12 weeks and achieve cure rates upwards of 95%. Mm -hmm. In the United States, these drugs are incredibly expensive. Uh, I think your audience may be aware this is the so-called $1,000 a pill mm -hmm. uh, drug, and certainly insurance companies and pharmacies have been able to lower that price, but it's still incredibly expensive, and we're talking mm -hmm. in the tens of thousands of dollars in the United States. Mm -hmm. We know that generic versions of these drugs are available in India for someone in the order of $150 a bottle, so mm -hmm. less than $500 for a full course of treatment of just mm -hmm. the pills alone, not laboratory tests, not medical doctor visits, mm -hmm. but to see the ratio of cost between an Indian generic drug, which is, is also very effective mm -hmm. compared to what retail prices are in high-income countries. Mm -hmm. it's, in, it's just staggering. And mm -hmm. I think what we're trying to do at Treat Asia is to share this pricing information with the rest of the world, first within the Asia-Pacific region, but also in Eastern Europe and with colleagues in other areas that are trying to negotiate for lower prices. So mm -hmm. really our focus has been on how can we improve hepatitis C treatment access now that there is a cure. Yeah, we really have to figure out every single community and how do we get, it's, it's all about getting the drug treatments to the people and getting them informed about why it's so important to take them in the proper way and so forth and become, you know, no longer positive for hepatitis in that case because it is, a, it is important because they can, uh, treatment is prevention in HIV as well as, as uh, hepatitis. I think for hepatitis C in particular, we've been working with drug user communities from South and Southeast Asia and giving them more information has been very powerful. Sharing with them about these medicines, talking to them about drug pricing, about patents, and that kind of knowledge, as you have said, is, is a form of power. And mm -hmm. so in trying to get people to be more aware consistently across the region, so it's not just a few pockets of information, but information now that's widely available on the web. Mm -hmm. Do you, and you're working with, uh, with I know with Vive Corporation, because we mentioned that earlier, or we talked earlier, um, do they, how do they, how do they fill the gaps that you that you need filled? Viv Healthcare has been partnering with Amphar's Treat Asia program for a number of years now, I think as far back as 2010, to support pediatric and adolescent related research. So we have done research looking at things like bone mineral density, mm -hmm. for example, sexual reproductive health, but we've also been more recently using their resources to help us develop youth leadership. And so we have a program called the Youth Akata Program, which is an Asian community of AIDS treatment leaders. Mm -hmm. And these are eight young people from four countries. All of them are under the age of 25. They're a mix of young people who've grown up living with HIV and those who acquired infection later in mm -hmm. life. And we're trying to give them the opportunity to learn more about their disease, learn how to do public speaking so mm -hmm, that they mm -hmm. can sit here and do the interview instead of me. Right. And I encourage you to have <laughs> them do that. <laughs> and, and so this kind of yeah. thing where we're trying to teach them yeah. to be advocates in their own communities. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing the same thing with our, our we're as far as putting together a, a young investigators uh, program, which we, it's, we call it introducing the young investigators because we have to know that this is the future. These are the folks that are going to grow up and they're going to have to take with them the principles and their values and do whatever they can to change the world because we can't allow governments to run roughshod over us. It's about the people taking control of their lives and policies and new ideas that can move things forward. And I really appreciate uh, ANFAR for doing that, uh, that work in that regard. It might be helpful to, to, once you find your eight are doing well, to use that to leapfrog into a number of many, many more 
in other countries. Well, actually, Viv is supporting us now to do a second cycle mm -hmm. of this leadership program. So we have five countries, and mm -hmm. we're going to be training another 10 young people and bringing them all together later on this year. It's very good work. I really appreciate what AMFAR does. It's uh, We've collaborated with you guys for videos over the years. And if there's anything we can do, and certainly getting the voice out, voices out of those, if they go to the Paris meeting or or Amsterdam, or the IS meetings, we'll be glad to uh, to chat with them and get them to explode their energy over the uh, the the, uh, the web and so forth. Well, thank you. We might take you up on that. <laughs> Hope so. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. Annette.